Hello and welcome to Eavesdropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we've seen uh, Sicario 2, uh, Day of the Soldado, or just in this country it's just Sicario 2, Soldado. Right. Soldado means soldier. You are such a whiz. I know, I know all... A linguist. All the languages. <laughs> a linguist and a gentleman. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sicario, the first one, was back in 2015. It was directed by Denis Villeneuve. Mm. Um, it's got a really good reputation. It made, it's great. made good money. Um, it was very popular. It's about It was about the um, war on drugs uh, between, uh, uh, well, the US on Mexico. Mm. Um, and it was... Well paced and careful and dark, and uh, erupted into violence in these amazing set pieces. It was a lot better than like, I'd been conditioned to sort of expect films <laughs> like this to be. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It was sort of a surprise, I think, that it was getting a sequel because it didn't. It made money, but it didn't make that much money. No. Um, and there didn't seem to be a place for a sequel to go. Really, like the story had been told. It seemed. Mm. Um, in this film they lose Emily Blunt there's no Emily Blunt um, the focus is on Benicio Del Toro and uh, Josh Brolin's characters who return and um, I, li- I like the way they interact in this don't know about you I, I like they, they seem very big on screen somehow like these are two huge stars yes. and and it's, it's almost like heat or something when they interact on screen it feels big and important but they're not on together all that much. No. They split up. I mean, um, they're two of my favorite actors, and they're very charismatic, and they're both very good actors, without really being like in the top rank of, of stardom. And so this really felt like an opportunity to see them you know, interact and interplay. And I think, in a way, that's what the film offers, though not as much as one would like. I, always very, I also very much like seeing Matthew Madine or Modine's appearance as the Secretary of State. Uh, you know, he's, he's someone, like, along the same lines. So, you know, so there was this period in the 80s where everyone thought he'd become a big star, and then he didn't quite, but he's become kind of an interesting presence in films. Mm. So all of those aspects I enjoyed, but the film, to me, seems like a programmer. Yeah, not, and no more than a programmer, actually. So, you know, there are enjoyable things. Uh, What's a programmer? Well, a programmer would be like, I mean, in the Hollywood era, it would be a film that was made only to pick up the slack and the bill. So it wasn't an A production. It wasn't one of the super expensive things that Mm. the whole studio was behind and geared and with big stars. It was, you know, normally the kind of thing that they churned out so that the theaters would would, would have enough product to keep changing the programs. Yeah. So it was like it was like a filler song on an album. Exactly, kind of like, like not that. the single. That's right. You mm. know, so this feels a little bit like that. That you know, it's kind of proficient. It's not unenjoyable. Um, it has a lot of problems. Uh, if you like action movies, you know, it passes away two hours very well. But actually, it's nothing in it is very memorable to me. Memorable is probably the word. I had a really good time. Um, I, 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 th- I guess I thought. Uh, well, the film opens on probably half an hour, forty minutes of pretty high, sort of intense action. For a long time, it just it gets right into it. Mm. There's very little downtime until uh, uh, Del Toro is um, with the girl at the deaf guy's house. Mm. That's the only time the film sort of calms down, really. There are, there, there, there are a couple of scenes with meetings, and there's, there's a sort of... There's a story of the, uh, the young kid who's, mm. not, who's just being introduced at that time. Um, but, it, but it's... The, 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 the kind of tempo, really, is very, very high for most of it. Um, which I really appreciated. I thought, you know, this is getting right into it. And um, in a way, it kind of felt less careful than the first film but I, pre- I actually appreciated sort of how it I, I, I liked I don't I would say I preferred the the sort of intensity of the, the, the speed of the film if you like but um, but I definitely liked it but it wasn't really messing around you know and I thought you know is it, is it, it, it's, it starts off being kind of silly 
So it opens up on uh, on the border again between the US and Mexico. Um, but instead of drugs being uh, the, the, the what's being moved across, it's now people. And not only is it people, it's terrorists. No. I said to you at the start, like they've combined America's two worst fears, Mexicans and Muslims. No. Literally, they smuggle... Uh, they smuggle terrorists, suicide bombs across the border, and then suicide bombs explode, and I think it's Kansas. Yes. This is how the film opens. So America decides it wants to you know, take disproportionate action on but, Mexico because they're a military junta. But I thought, I thought there was something wrong with that, actually, because I kept waiting for that to somehow be developed and to become part of the rest of the film, and it isn't. So, you know, kind of the only point being made at the beginning is that you know, now to transport people is bigger business than to transport drugs. Mm. There are all these cartels that kind of operate in this corrupt government, right? And yeah, yeah, you, you're waiting. You for lose it. the Muslim bit, like after the first. Oh, uh, yeah, that's absolutely for sure. And I think it's, it, people have been saying how uh, the film is timely because obviously the conversation that's going on right now yeah. is not just about migration, uh, illegal immigration, migration, but it's also about the, the sort of. Um, wildly disproportionate American response to it right now yeah. in the separation of, um, of, of children from their families which that which is not exactly something that the film mm. picked up on I mean it would be amazing if the film did predict that but um, it, it's uh, certainly the kind of fear of, of illegal immigration from Mexico um, is, is something that the, the, the film is sort of building on I guess but it's not really saying anything it's not really saying anything and I, and I spent a little while kind of finding trying to find what it was saying mm. and in the end it gave up because it's not really no. well, if, if anything it's not actually talking about Ill illegal immigration if anything it's talking about the American response to it but it's not even really doing that no. um, well the interesting thing about it is the openness with which the film treats American interventionism yeah right so you yeah. know um, they don't try to hide it you know, basically, Ameri you know, the Americans are just kidnapping, you know, the, the child of one of the drug lords because, you know, if you want to create a stir in a place, you kidnap their prince, is what we're told. This, right? is, uh, this was a fantastic uh, scene, and I wrote this down uh -huh. I really loved it. Um, it's all in this really heightened kind of regal language. Mm. You know, they talk about, as you say, uh, uh, killing kings. You know, if you, uh, I, I don't, Josh Bonner says, I, I don't see the point of killing a king because you create 50 more. You know, and they talk about if you want to kill, if you want to, uh, you want to get the king to start the war, so kidnap the prince. Mm. Which is when you're talking about taking the kid, and then there's something else which was more subtle, which was the defense secretary saying, um, he says to Josh Brolin, these tactics that you used in the Middle East, will they work in Mexico? Mm. And Josh Brolin says they will if you want them to, mm. which has a kind of. Like, if you will it, you are the king kind of feeling to it. Well, no, I felt, I felt that that line had more to do. They will if you want them to. If you support us, they will. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if you don't support it, then they won't. And actually, that is what ends up happening, right? Halfway through the operation, they back off because they can't deal with, yeah. you know, the media reverb from it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I kind of... I... I... I wasn't bored for once, but but actually it left me nonplussed. Uh, and I think actually, in comparison to the first film, what is missing is the kind of moral conscience that um, Emily Blunt brought to it, mm. right? Because you know she was the FBI or the the whatever the person who played by the book, you know, new recruits, I think. Yeah, yeah, you know, who believed in the rules, right? Uh, and actually, this doesn't, and nobody does, and. You know, so it feels, and, and actually that in itself could be really interesting. I don't mind that. So I don't mind if you're brought into this corrupt world and, you know, and there's this, this cynicism and everything is goal oriented. But actually, very interesting that the film pauses goal oriented to keep things the same, I to keep on churning money, right? Like, you know, the, it's not about solving a problem or whatever, it's actually to keep the business going. And by that is meant also. The military, the diplomacy, the drug thing, the good people trafficking thing, right? Uh, I thought that was very interesting. But then I thought the film cops out because it actually gets sentimental about the child. You know, so I think if you're going to follow that line of corruption, so what ends up happening is that the Americans think you have to kill the child, mm. right? Because she's seen us, 
right? And uh, it could reveal it. So, you know, you could understand why Benicio del Toro might want to protect the child, right? Uh, but uh, uh, the Josh Brolin character is, you know, all of a sudden he gets sentimental. I mean, he's probably blown up thousands of kids. Why get sentimental about this one, right? So I thought that was like, you know, if you really want to depict a morally murky and corrupt world, then do so consistently. Don't back off at the end. Did he get sentimental? Yes, he did. Well, he said something like, "We'll put her into witness oh, protection." Oh, that's right. Put her into because he says, "Yeah, he says to the bosses, fuck 'em all.'" Yeah. That's, the, that's the attitude he takes basically halfway through the film. It's just fuck 'em all because things start sort of going against him. Um, yeah, m yeah, maybe. I mean, he certainly got sentimental about Benicio del Toro. That I could understand. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, though, I also think that. The film doesn't develop that well. So, for example, you know, I mean, I love the whole thing where he got shot, and you kind of know something's going to happen because you don't see his face. So, actually, for a moment, I thought that actually it was somebody else that might have been shot, and, mm. you know, he'd appear from somebody else. But no, it turns out it really is him, right? Um, but I didn't like the way the film ended, so... The very, very end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought... Like, you, you don't know what happens. I would have liked him to have found shelter you know so what happens is you know he, he's had a bullet through both cheeks he's losing blood like anything he ends up fighting people then he gets to the side of the road where you think oh god that's over and then he begins to move again right mm -hmm. you know but he's just on the road and actually the shot isn't even held that long so if the shot had been held longer you could say okay he's, he's, he's now on his way yeah. home you know but it doesn't even do that so actually you expect Something you you expect something like, you know, and I th I think just leaving the audience there and then presenting him one year later. Well, what happened in that year? Like I, you know, yeah. I mean that's important that, information. That, that, that coda is purely there to set up a third film. Yes, you know. but it's very unfair to the audience. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and to, and also to show you that he's got his nice pretty face back. Yeah. I mean, I was hoping for like half his jaw to have been shot off. It was a bullet to the face. Yeah, but so he's like, he comes back, he's, he's just got like a, a pinprick through both cheeks, and he's like, but I'm still Benicio del Toro. Yes. Also, you know, I, uh, there's another... I did think he might have been dead. Did, uh, you, did you think there was any danger of him actually having died, or did you think here now he's going to be all right? No, no, I thought there was a possibility that he might die on the way, which is why I expected something else. To... Yeah. I, I either expected him to reach, to reach shelter of some kind, like a petrol station or something, mm. Or to see him like what about I mean when he was actually shot and lying on the ground, I thought that was I, I thought I, I, it's funny because I th there's no tension in the film, D despite the fact that you've got sort of you've got him at gunpoint being held by the cartel, the the girl he's there, you, it should be dripping with tension and it's not and it isn't and but that's a problem. It should be a problem, but I but actually I, I think it is a problem. I, it should be a problem. But I didn't find it a problem. I still found the film really exciting. So although when he's eventually shot in the face, um, I, you know, it, it was I was a surprise to me. I didn't go, oh my god. I kind of went, ooh, that's interesting. They shot Venetian the Zorro. Right? I thought I thought that was one of the most gripping scenes. Actually, you know, the thing about getting that young child to do it, and then yeah. you know, uh, uh, and actually the moment where uh, he lifts his face. You see the blood dripping out. It really, you know, had an impact on me. So I like that. Um, but I do think there's a problem that the film lacks tension. And actually, part of the reason why the film lacks tension is because you don't know who to root for. There's nothing at stake in it, in a way. Mm. You know. Um, so I think that is a problem. I also thought that there was a problem between the way that things were visualized and the way that scenes were built. So actually, the film has very beautiful lighting, you know, again, very intricate lighting. Yeah, but the shots themselves are very, like, not memorable, really, and also not expressive. It's usually kind of a wide shot. Yeah, so I kind of... And I thought, I thought almost all the scenes, including the action scenes, lack tension. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had laughs and jolts, like, you know, the scene where he throws the bomb in the car... Yeah, it's mm. kind of, it feels almost funny. Oh, it's, it's a joke. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, there's nothing at stake. There should be something about him almost dying on his last legs, now being chased by another car. You should be mm. feeling something, and you, and you don't, or I don't. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And um, 
and this is why I'm saying like that lack of tension should be a problem for me. You know, the, the film is... The, 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 the world that these characters are in is brutal and unforgiving. And, you know, Benicio del Toro survives by the skin of his teeth. You know, he's got a bullet through his face. He's, he's tied up. It's, it's head kind of bandaged and, and taped up, whatever. How the, and, and everyone thinks he's dead. There's no one coming for him. Mm. He's losing a lot of blood. And yet he gets out of it. Like, it's a fucking brutal place to be. Um so you should be feeling tension and danger everywhere and you're just not the film actually film feels like a knockabout sort of light hearted film almost like despite the fact that it's violent and, and dealing with some kind of dark mm. subject matter I also didn't like but I had no problem with that I had well the time. I have problems with it but it is too light I mean I can't um, I have problems with it and I think, I think there's also ideological things with it because mm. I don't know if you noticed but you know Almost none of the Americans on the mission are lost. No. You know, whereas the Mexicans drop off like flies. They, their lives don't matter. And it's not just because you don't know them. Because actually, you know, like in the American team, you just know the protagonists. All the others, like they could have lost a few, but actually they don't. You yeah. know, and I think that speaks of a particular kind of treatment of others. Yes. That, uh, um, you know, I found, the, I found a problem with... Um, I also thought certain things weren't well developed enough. So, you know, there's meant to be a kind of a homology between the young, the male child who chooses to, you know, to 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 join, uh, you know, the 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 gang, uh, and the girl who is in, you know, the the princess of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 cartel, you know. So there's a kind of a homology that's kind of done there. There's a kind of a homology between. Benito del Toro losing his daughter and, you know, now being with this other girl, mm. you know, and they're kind of plonked there, but they're not really worked through kind of in a way that resonates or that has an emotional impact. Uh, so I thought, um, you know, for all of those reasons, the film to me was a disappointment. Yeah, I, I, I did quite like del Toro and, and, and the little girl, I think. Like, there was a little bit of complexity in there because um, del Toro lost his daughter to um, uh, cartel murder, basically. And um, the girl's uh, dad is the guy who um, had was in charge of the guy who did it. So that is the, the sort of... He, yeah, he basically, he, sa he's, he says, I'm an enemy of your dad's. Yes. But um, he also is kind of of the understanding <laughs> that she's a 16-year-old girl and she didn't do anything. He's looking after her. Yes. Know? Um, but there is this kind of tension there, like he's looking after her, but for the guy who is responsible for basically everything going wrong in his life um, and a huge amount of pain in his life. Um, and then is, is she a kind of replacement for his daughter? Like, or is he kind of latching onto her for that reason? Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's not developed, but no. I liked what was there. The film doesn't resonate emotionally, and actually, all of the human relationships could have been further developed with not very much. So actually, I would have liked more to have been made out of the friendship between Josh Brolin and Benito del Toro. There's clearly one, and it's clearly not just a professional one, right? Like, so, you know, obviously they're both professionals, and, you know, there's that kind of Hoxian thing about doing your job properly is part of what makes you a man. <laughs> yeah, but actually, you know, there's also kind of affection and humor. Like you say, the screen lights up when they're together. There's something about their interplay. So why not develop just that, you know, mm. that bit further, right? Put, have some emotional resonance when there's a loss, you know, which the film tries for, but it's very weakly so, you know. So, um, and I also think, I mean, Benito del Toro is wonderful, and I love the way that he speaks softly when negotiating very um, uh, uh, complex yeah, and very difficult situations. His mm. voice lowers and, you know, he begins a negotiation. I love, I love the way that he characterizes uh, this person. Um, but I think the affective relationships are not, um, you know, they, they're almost not there, you know. I um, really enjoyed when Del Toro and the girl get to the farm uh, and, and they start talking to the deaf guy, or he starts talking to the deaf guy because he knows sign language. Because um, not only, I mean, that's not only him being quiet, he's silent. Yes. Like the film has been loud and brash yes. and kind of bright 
uh, a, a noisy up until now, and it just it cuts everything out, mm. and it's and, and it's this this calm sort of he, he's got a massive gun on him, so he's saying calm down, I'm not going to hurt you or anything, we need help, and the the tone changes pretty abruptly. Do you think it was? Do you think it was too much? Do you think it was kind of wrong headed? I really enjoyed it. Um. What I was feeling during that is that they could have made it so much better and more, you know, by just uh, making that lull, a lull, i.e. that there's, they're in the middle of a threat. So I would have liked maybe some cross shooting between, you know, someone now knows where they are and they're out to get them or, yeah, mm -hmm. just, you know, to have like kind of, you know, this, what they feel is a lull, yeah be signaled as temporary whilst they're kind of working out more emotive things. I mean, there's a way of adding layers to scenes like that, and I think mm. this is too one note. Yeah, maybe. But I, I, I guess... Um, I mean, it, that is kind of brought in when... Uh, because then, uh, with at the same time, Josh Bowen's character is told, uh, you're no longer in charge of this. Catherine Keener's has taken over. Catherine Keener says, right, kill everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so then he calls Del Toro, this interesting phone call where he says... I've got to come and kill you, basically. I know, but that happens after. No, that happens in the middle. That happens while he, he takes the phone call when oh. he's in the flat, doesn't it? In the flat, in the. Well, he leaves the house to take the phone. Yeah, call, yeah. Yes. They're staying there at the time, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and that, and then that kind of you know make, makes them leave. Um, yeah, but, but that's. I know what you mean, though. Um, it's, I mean, it's not like well, it's certainly not under any. They're not under any sort of threat, really, like imminent while they're there. Mm. They are allowed to take a few minutes to themselves. Yes. Um. um Anyways, so... It's, I should have problems with this film. I mean, for all the reasons you've described, and some of the reasons I've described, like I say, there's no tension. Well... And, and that uh, it has a really cavalier uh, attitude to killing Mexicans, and, and said, but the Americans are all going to be fine, don't worry about it. Um, you know, I should have problems with this. I, I wouldn't say it feels like uh, propaganda in the way that like, yeah, a Michael no. Bay film does, for instance. No. But, but it, is, it is a problem. For me, the reason why I called it a programmer is because it's not offensive, you know, like I wasn't bored at all, right? And so, and you know, you do spend an enjoyable couple of hours, um, but I think nothing is memorable. And, you know, there are very talented people here. I mean, I, I read that the, you know, the screenwriter was the screenwriter of uh, High, and, High and Low, or what was it I called? Know. The screenwriter of the first film. Uh, yeah, uh, but also that, you know, that really wonderful film with Chris Pine, Helen Highwater. Oh, um, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, kind of... There's nothing offensive. I loved watching the actors. It's Some scenes are non-stop action, right? So, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's like one of those old westerns. Like, you, you know, you know what you're going to get. It does the job. Yeah. Yeah, but kind of, you know, you're not going to remember it like a John Ford or an anti-man western or something. There's nothing memorable in it. That's the way I feel about this film. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think I, I, I think it's still, it maintains some of the darkness of the first film. You know, particularly the end where you've got this, this kid who, um, you've, been, you've been watching this kid, the, the boy that says, throughout the film, kind of thinking is he going to, like he's, he's getting involved in this gang that smuggles people across the border. Is, is he going to sort of he seems to be on the fence, right? So which way is he going to tip? Mm. Um, and then by the time you get to the coda, it's one year later, he's shot. He's the one who shot Benicio Del Toro in the face. He was kind of forced to by um, the the people in charge of the gang. Um, he almost had no choice, right? He saw the, yes. the first one who refused got killed, so... <laughs> exactly. So he had to do it. Uh, then you see a year later, all, all of a sudden he's, he's covered in tattoos. He seems to have a harem following him. And then t Del Toro... Uh, confronts him having tracked him down I, mean, I thought that was really funny you must have heard me laughing when he, when he comes through to the, walks in the door and Benicio, Benicio Del Toro is standing there looking at him and he's going fucking hell I killed you like I, that was that was I found that really really funny I, but then he gone <laughs> I, I didn't <laughs> uh, but actually you know what puzzles me about that young man is you know when they're all heading back, so he's just he's just killed El Toro, hmm. and you know they're heading back the whole gang and they're kind of celebrating in a way, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the kid's first time killing whatever, and he leaves the truck and says, "Drop me off here," mm -hmm. you know, and they're all celebrating and he's not, and I couldn't quite like 
I mean, I got it, but I was one. But I, you get a feeling that there's more. That yeah. You know, why yes. did he choose to leave at that moment? You know. Well, I think I, I, the film. I guess uh, for what I took that as was was he's just killed someone, and this is as I said, this is a kid who's been on the fence the whole time, and so he's done something. He's done the worst thing you can do, really, um, and he is struggling with it. You know, he was forced into it. Like I say, it wasn't exactly his choice because he would have died. So, so he's struggling, and he doesn't. He can't. He just can't be in that place with everyone else in the back of the truck, so going woo hey, what And about to be left in the middle of nowhere. You know. But I think, like, I, I mean, that's probably the place you want to be if you've just had to shoot someone in the post. I think you're but, making. No, but I like I got that. But but what was disappointing was that they just kind of left him there, and then you pick up a year later, and. Okay, so now he's this hardcore gangster covered in tattoos and the rest. Like, wh- as you say, what the fuck happened in that year? Yeah. Um, you know, that is disappointing. And, and, and even when, you, when he's looking at Del Toro at the end of the film, I think it still maintains that ambiguity about him. Like, okay, so he must be, he's clearly playing the part mm. of, of this of the gangster. Of tattoos now. He's yeah. Been... But he sees Del Toro and he's still a little kid, yes. terrified. Especially terrified because someone's just come back from the dead in front of him. Yes. But he he doesn't sort of know where he is. And then Del Toro says, so you want to be a Sicario, which is a Let's man. talk. <laughs> Let's talk. And this is how the film ends. And, you know, it's disappointing narratively because it leaves this big open question and then obviously they want to make a third film, I guess. Mm. But, um... But you didn't care. <laughs> I sort of didn't like. If I if they make a third one, I will go and see it. I will. I will I, as well. I um, will as well. I, and if it's by, if it's like this one, you know, what I mean, I will go and see it, and I'll have a really good time. Actually, I'm thinking, you know, if I can find some time later on, on tonight, I'm going to go see the first one again. Yeah. So you know, it kind of. Um, first one was great. The bit in the in the traffic jam was fucking amazing hmm. in the first film. That's the bit I remember I can't, most. I can't remember it well. Fantastic. Which is why I, I, I mean, see. that is the kind of tension this film should have had. Yes. But um. But, you know, I mean, it's two different worlds. Denis Villeneuve is like, on top of the fucking world at the minute. But it's not just that, anyway. I mean, I'm interested in the thing that you don't care, that actually it offered, mm. you know, it offered you certain satisfaction. So maybe kind of summarizing them would be a good way to kind of finish this podcast. This podcast. So kind of what were the satisfactions that you got out of the film? It sounds kind of... It sounds stupid, but because um, I don't know when people say this but I liked that I could sort of switch off I liked that it, it became fairly clear fairly early on that um, it wasn't going to deal with the subject matter um, with the seriousness that the first film did mm. and, um, and and that it sort of made up for that by just being really exciting really high tempo and having these two you know Big stars, um, kind of, kind of in charge of every scene. It had to, it had some sort of fun dialogue. Like, I don't want to make it sound like it was like a, <laughs> like I don't know, like a action adventure or like a like a Rambo or something. Like it wasn't like that. It's still kind of hinting at some at certain darkness, you know. And like I say, the landscape is re- is brutal. And I think it conveys that pretty well. But um, as you say, like it's it's like those those westerns or mm. it's, it's it's like it's it's what you go to the cinema for you want to have a bit of fun <laughs> okay I don't know uh, well, it's, it's, like I say I should have problems but right. I don't I'm just cool with it okay well that's a good note to uh, end up <laughs> on uh, so thank you for listening we are on iTunes SoundCloud Facebook and and Twitter so uh, 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 do drop us a line if uh, there's an aspect of the film uh, that has uh, caught your attention and that we've somehow bypassed, or if you have a different view than us on the, on the film itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Because for we do that all the time. <laughs> 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 right on. Let's send it here. <laughs>